Hello and welcome to the Penny Stamp Speaker Series in collaboration with the University of Michigan Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning Lecture Series. I'm Tom Moran, an Associate Professor at Taubman College, and it is my honor to introduce today's event featuring designer, performer, and educator Teresa Ruler from the studio The Rodina. The Rodina is a post-critical design studio with an experimental practice drenched in strategies of performance art, play, and subversion. The Rodina invents ways in which experience, knowledge, and relations are produced and preserved. In their work, Teresa and her partner Vit explore the spatial and interactive possibilities of virtual environments as a space for new thoughts and aesthetics that come forward from between culture and technology. The studio works mostly for cultural clients such as the Harvard GSD, Sonic X Foundation, and Hyundai Card Library Seoul. This event was conceived in partnership with the Taubman College faculty research cluster Beta Matter, of which I'm a member, working to critically engage with XR tools for their deployment in design and pedagogical applications, both locally and nationally, working on issues pertaining to mixed reality as they relate to material and spatial practices while rethinking our experiences within these overlapping physical and digital environments. How do we make freedom and playfulness, traditionally granted to artists, accessible to a wider audience? And how do we design situations or objects that stimulate activity and participation that could lead to a transformation in a viewer or a social context? Please join me in welcoming Teresa Ruler to explore the answers to these questions. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Collective Worlding. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks, uh, Dean Jonathan Messi, Katie Cole, and Christina Hamilton for inviting me. And big thanks to Ishan Paul for putting it all together. This lecture is called Collective Worlding, and it's composed into three chapters. Each chapter has a life component. Today, together, we will look at the practice of performative design, its methods, tools, inspirations, and selected projects. Here we go. Our studio is like a laboratory. We look at our projects from different perspectives. Every project we do, we think which areas it touches and where do we want it to be. Um, for that, we use axis thinking. We would like to be in the middle of these axes. For example, experimentation is important, but in um, what degree does it allow um, for experimentation when we also want to have an excellence in our projects? Um, context, imagination, technology, concept. Those are all important. So we as designers are trying to look at the, at the future and how our projects uh, form, uh, form those futures. But everyone can have a different, uh, different access thinking, so you can try to sketch it out yourself. So let's ask in the first chapter, how can design leads towards transformation of self and potentially social change? How do we invite alienated audience to share and experience situations as active part of our design? My answer is through performance in design. Design has capacity to leave, to con to leave the constraints of an object-centric practice. The design discourse is frequently about experience and event rather than something static, like used to be um, a text, a poster, image. So what if we design situations or processes? And ultimately, can viewers of our design be more affected or even involved in these design situations? That's my question. Because the audience previously conceived as a viewer is now repositioned as a co-producer or participant. Here, performance has the power to engage viewers, invite them to be part of design processes through exchange, through creating new relations and opening dialogues. And hopefully that leads to potential change. So what do we mean by performativity? 
It's very complex layered term, but here in performative design, by performativity, we mean active bodies, chance, play and experimentation with design processes. And that's happening in special time and space, which is unique, therefore unrepeatable. Um, all that leads to transformation. But what is special? This transformation is not visible during the performance. It's happening inside, inside the participant. Performative design is transformative practice. But how to invite participants inside your situation to co-create it and play with it? That's my question, because it's so difficult. People just don't want to easily join such events, especially if it's a bit more performative. So we do it through some props um, and tools. That's why we design graphic scores. So these, these are printed graphic scores, and we see them as scripts for possible modes of action. These scores bring more than choreography. They instigate social process. And why? Because these scores, they challenge the hierarchy between um, composer, designer and the participant, right? So participants, they can interpret it, interpret these kind of rules or suggestions or invitations on their own and they can play with them. And that's where it gets all very exciting. Inspiration comes from uh, Lucy Lippert. Um, in the 70s, uh, she self-published instruction cards, which served as a catalogue um, for conceptual uh, art and performance art, basically fine arts. Five years later, Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt, they uh, published um, another set of instruction cards called Oblique Strategies. And that's something, these cards, they meant to kick um, the creative process, which is, uh, which is stuck. So if you're a musician or artist, or maybe, yeah, somebody creative, you take a card and there is something special for you. You might not listen to it, but you can play with it. And that helps your process. That's why the research on performative design is also published or self-published in the form of set of collectible cards. For now, I have 27 cards, but my idea is to expand this research. Um, it's, it's an inspiring tool um, because it, it reveals possibilities of communication design. Look at all these ingredients. Huh? There's, uh, there are many options uh, for adding new cards. So what are the ingredients of performative design? Um, yeah, and how I would define performative design right now, looking at all these terms. Performative design, it's, it is a transformative, integrative and critical design practice that embraces evenness, see it as time and space, and chance. So anything can happen during that. And it has magical power to involve viewers. In early 60s, Ben Patterson was among a small group of Fluxus artists, including Lamonte Young, Yoko Ono, John Cage, and they pushed performance to radical extremes. But here I'm inspired by fine art, by performance art. Eh? Um, look at his performance script in the middle. Isn't it incredible? And that's uh, that really led, led us and inspired us to create also um, performative performance scripts. Um, so before each performance happens, we prepare possible modes of action, possible schemes for action. And these are like visual scripts for performance. But Patterson also took musical scripts and turned them into role play instructions. He designed performative games and playgrounds. And we've learned from Patterson, so his practice led us to investigate and create various playgrounds. These playgrounds, we see them as spaces where performance can happen. And inside these spaces, we can listen to each other and let others to have a voice. So this one you can see it's called Unionize and it has been conceived as a space to come together, to gather, to discuss together. And it's designed um, 
for rethinking and reshaping culture norms and values within the group of participants. It's a special critical space um, that unwraps um, the heaviness or the difficulties um, of the creative industry. Our playgrounds are designed as spaces for mapping and inviting the imaginary. We embrace collectivist production of future imagination. Um, these playgrounds, they are hopefully safe spaces for experimentation, inclusion, as well as collision and friction. Because whenever you invite people into these spaces, of course, different ideas might clash with each other, different perspectives, but that's welcome. That's, we want to work with that. So yeah, that can happen. Also friction. On the photo, you can, uh, you can see uh, the space, one of the spaces for uncertainty seminars, which is a series of community events, um, expanding the concept of uncertainty as, as a critical tool. Um, and here is another playground during action at the Design Museum London. Participants, they can explore it as Situationist International, so that's an art movement from the 60s, and they explored cities by their very special method called Derive, Derive in French, and Guy Debord, the leading figure, he defined the Derive as a mode of experimental behavior linked to the conditions of an urban society. Basically, that means it's a method of passage through the city. It's an unplanned journey where the city invites you to walk through it without any special plans. So you wander through the urban landscape. And this map is inspired by this method. You could see people there. So, and I talk about participation. So why? Why is doing this together with participants important? Why is this participation a key? According to participatory art theorist Claire Bishop, you can read uh, her book, uh, Artificial Health, participation is a key as it rehumanizes a society fragmented by the repressive instrumentality of capitalist production, where um, Human labor is just a resource to be capitalized upon, basically. Here also comes a critique of often misused participatory design, where designers need audience or audiences to precisely finish their task, to complete the design. No, no, no. We do not intend to use human resources in such manner. No way. This is different because our approach is all about the process where people have creative freedom to interpret, shake the hierarchies, right? Um, and sharing is really important. Therefore, togetherness can evolve in such spaces, in such playgrounds, right? People have their voice. So it's key to mention Augusto Boal's uh, concept of emancipated spect actor. So it's not just a spectator, it's active acting spectator, spect actor. And that comes from his practice of theater of the oppressed, 70s Brazil. And that's inspired by Paul Freire's uh, book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But back to playgrounds. We hope to create most needed space to doubt together. We use performative design as means for creating and recreating new relations between people. It's a tool for transformation that enrolls feeling, intellect and imagination, as well as tool for education or you might say a bit of de-schooling maybe. This playground you can see here, it's um, called a map of scattered society and it has a sister which is called Map of Empathic Society. And that was exhibited at the 5th Istanbul Biennale last year. The geometric forms that you can see and all these emoji inhabited places on the playground, they work as a vertigo to pull the viewer into the playground. So you want to step in, you want to come in. In the Rodina, in the studio, we believe in the importance of caring and playing in order for an empathic society to develop. 
These playgrounds, they are at the same time fictional maps. There is something very poetic about it, putting it all together. It's geography of imaginary places. This one is currently exhibited at the uh, Van Abbe Museum. We call it Carpet of Voices. Here you can see it a bit, uh, yeah, it's settling down. It's, it's very fresh on this, on this photo. So we're waiting for, we were waiting for one week to, um, to have it kind of more flat. And that Carpet of Voices, it contains or it's inspired by texts uh, and lectures of influential female rebels, activists, and also partisans who, I don't want to use that verb, who fight, who advocate uh, for, for uh, racial and non-binary equality. Um, you enter through the pillar of Octavia Butler. So this, uh, you must have known know her, right? A sci-fi writer. And also at present day, uh, she, she is a critic of different hierarchies, of course. And then Angela Davis, political activist. There are more thinkers in that circle of the carpet. Um, and what I can say that all these playgrounds, they steer imagination through collective exploration and play. Inside, participants are becoming explorers, players, the flaneurs, flaneurs and mental travelers. That's inspired, so some of the places in these fictional maps, in these playgrounds, are inspired by Catherine Yusuf and how she examines the earth under colonialism and slavery. Very important book. She initiates conversation between black feminist theory, geography and uh, various earth sciences. She's addressing the politics of the Anthropocene within the context of race, materiality, gender and geology. It's a very special book, you can see it, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None. She starts her book with the end of the world, and why not? And this is a quote taken by Master of Contemporary Fantasy by Nora Keita Jemisin. Uh, in Jemisin's book, Fifth Season, we breathlessly follow three super powerful female characters oppressed by the society, but they have special powers. And the story, you can read, it's three books. It's a fantasy. And it's an amazing story about different capacities, but also vulnerability of certain communities. And um, Partly our maps are, are also inspired by Donna Haraway's concept of multi-species, togetherness and relationality in her epic, iconic book, Staying with the Trouble. And she writes, um, well, how can I say? She wishes us to reconfigure our relations with each other, but also with Earth and all its inhabitants, human and human. I would say, and I would add, I don't have that book here on the slide, but also there's a huge inspiration by Ursula Le Guin and her uh, a series of, of uh, fantasy books. But yeah, I can add it maybe later. Let's go and dive into a life experience right now. Um, we will all go together to spatialaffairs.epfl pavilions. Uh, which is a Swiss website, .ch, uh, where we're going to meet together and experience something together. Yeah, so see you there. Okay, we are back in chapter two. Design environments. Cohabitation, togetherness and what you could experience on that website, it's, it's more about matter and bodies and bodies as organs and what would be a technological organ, for example, and it's all built in one very special environment. Okay, we should start the second chapter. So it's about dealing with design as a living ecosystem. That's what I want to say. With its relations and connections. Um, so how will future generations see our time and what will remain for them? What kind of world is result of our work, of our labor? What planet are we passing on to them? What will be left from all beautiful images and seductive designs we create? This is a future fossil. 
we see fossil as the remain of the age when humans, us, irreversibly changed the geological setup of the planet. So that's how I would describe the age of Anthropocene, basically. However, these are morphing bodies, hybrids between geological, technological and biological bodies. And I call them pickled humans. While we were rendering all these pickled humans, the fossils, the future fossils, we worked on publication that gathers fascinating knowledge. It contains essays uh, about intersectional feminism, forensic architecture, alternatives to capitalism. It's, it's, it's really full of amazing texts and, and, and thoughts. And we were desperate to activate this important knowledge which is locked inside the book. Because honestly, who reads such a theoretical book? It's difficult to read. How to make content accessible and attractive to people who don't typically read such books. That was our challenge. How to make it more inclusive. How to transform the content into a spatial experience. So what if spreads become walls and you can walk around them? What happens when the book becomes environment. Yeah, we build it. You can explore it as a player. Hereby the top, top view of the main architecture of the central area. So basically you start in the area of, of feminism and then you can, uh, you can discover way more. Let's, uh, let's look at it. Uh, what I want to say also, this is a meta book. And why meta? Because you collect uh, you collect this book um, inside the book and um, if you're a player, player with the highest score you can also win the book. But that was a plan for event for the launch of the book so um, it's not active anymore but you can enjoy um, the video, um, the, the play through the game. I guess you get the idea, you can also see it on our Vimeo. Um, so turning physical book into a video game um, raises a particular question. How can designers create virtual worlds as alternatives and proposals to the current world we live in? And with that I mean the world uh, we fantasize um, is not necessarily an escape from reality. Uh, it's rather a wish. And we do that, all of us, hopefully, through our imagination. We sculpt and plan virtual worlds. We create unstable surfaces that are in constant change, in the movement, in time, in feeling. Because tools, software, knowledge and hardware for such world making are widely accessible. Why should they be left only for commercial purposes in hands of companies of entertaining industry? No, artists, designers, architects can use game engines and virtual worlds as their medium. World making is a powerful force in constructing our dreams and desires. Last year, when COVID-19 locked us all in our homes, in the moment of extreme, extreme uncertainty and increasing isolation, we can all remember how difficult that was, we've been prototyping some tools for spending time together. We did our first virtual performance of the grid uh, from the commercial streaming platforms. Together with Jessica Deira, we created a bidding event 
where users could buy virtual playgrounds from us. So this virtual performance had a gamified participatory elements in it. Uh, practical question. Um, how can we move our playgrounds into virtual world? How is performance inside virtual worlds relevant to us, to designers? How can we perform inside these virtual worlds that we built? And how can we make online visitors feel close to each other? Uh -huh. This togetherness. And the project was called Playbird. And playbur is a term and uh, it basically means that your free time is actually work, like on Twitch. You have fun, but it's actually labor. And somebody else is uh, making profit on that, on your time, on your fun. And this is typical for, for the platform capitalism, um, TikTok, Instagram or Instagram stories, Facebook, you name it. And in Playbird exhibition, in this virtual exhibition, we are looking at how work and play are becoming merged, unseparable. Um, good to mention Ching, Ching Jungwon, South Korean scholar. He explores how play becomes hijacked by the capitalist mode of production. He writes, transition from the industrial society to the information society takes a play form. The play is very important here. The next virtual performance that we experimented on was done with Handy Kim and it was all about inhabiting a disproportionately huge non-human virtual bodies and sharing our desires. In the platform capitalism, in the age of self-performance, on social media and these days on a never-ending conference calls and streaming platforms. We all perform what we do. We perform our jobs. It's us, ultimate workers. We live in the world of colors and hope, happily exploited, performing like mad. We pioneered the online performance in live multiplayer mode, built with a custom code here in the studio well, not here, because the studio is somewhere else. Now I'm um, making this lecture from my home, actually. Uh, but we built it with the custom code developed by us. Um, and yeah, you can see it um, later. I will show you another part of it. Um, but it's important to mention something connected with Playbur. Isabel Harbison, Harbison, she writes about how um, consuming and producing images and... Um, creates addiction and this addiction makes us to work for free, right? In the service of the global corporate expansion and colonization of our personal data, information, images, yeah, you name it. Uh, you can read her, her book, Performing Image. It's, it's, um, it's quite new and it's by MIT Press. So let's dive into one of these playbook um, parts of the virtual show together in the second chapter. I would like us all to experience it. So let's go. Huh? Uh, let's go to desires.tetem.nl and we will all meet together there at desires.tetem.nl. So see you there, yeah? Okay, welcome back from Desires at Tetem. I hope you had fun. Um, what I would like to say that it's a strange phenomena uh, but while creating all these virtual worlds, we realize that they are more inclusive, affordable and accessible. Because you don't have to be anywhere physically, you can experience them as a player from your home or from another place. So they are more inclusive um, or accessible than some galleries, theaters or schools. You can explore them freely like that. I mean, you need to be online. Uh, since 2020, we designed and programmed nine different um, virtual multiplayer environments for different culture events. Here is a little list, so if you want to explore more and dive into it, like please do so. Yeah, there are quite some. Um, yeah, you can just try that. But not now, we will go into the chapter number three. Uh, thinking about the game environments, Let's look outside. 
I mean from the window, let's say. Let's look at the world around us. Let's get involved in the matter of the physical world by asking how to design um, to reveal rather than hide. Let's not be uh, afraid to unwrap more, more complex and difficult stories. One day we looked at planet surface through the gaze of a satellite and combined this imagery with uh, what is underground, what is hidden to our eyes. Infrastructures and maps of heavy industries and underground mines and quarries, they have a lot to tell. And my question is, has capitalism made Earth a purely economic resource? So let's unwrap the complexity. Where exactly is mining happening? Who profits and who doesn't have a voice in carbon uh, extractivism? So we identified several extraction locations of different chemical and rare earth met uh, metals and elements, like for example, neodymium, yttrium, palladium, but, but also titanium, and then more easy ones, copper and gold. And why copper and gold? We wrote an essay about massive resource extraction behind design surfaces. So that's why we use these elements or selection of these chemical elements to look at what is behind the design. Because we all use these elements in our devices or when we print. Um, all our smartphones, our super 5K screens, everything in the studios we use is made out of these very special, unique elements that are taken from the ground. Yeah, all is made from scarce resources, chemical elements and rare earth metals, and we extract them from the upper crust of the planet. So capitalism is basically chewing the planet it depends on. But of course we depend on capitalism, so it's a, it's a paradox. But great to know and be aware of that everything that surrounds us has been carefully crafted, innovated and shaped by us designers. Design theorist Alice Twemlow, she talks about visibility, measurability and direct impact of the damage by design that puts us into and the planet into direct danger by products and even values we might share or our lifestyle. She writes, the damage being done to our planet by the products, processes and values generated by design is increasingly visible and measurable. Specifically in this design and in the essay, we problematize the old conception of norms such as binary or patriarchy. And why? Because norms, they cut through rather than connect. It's never male or female in these old binaries or human versus the planet. No, we care for intersectional equality, togetherness. We are in it together and we are on board of one particular and unique spaceship called Earth. Talking about togetherness, uh, we care for these multi-species because we are our own example here. We know for long that our own bodies are, are vessels of interconnected organisms. We are earthlings interwoven and knotted with microbes and bacteria. Here I'm following again Donna Haraway's concept of this relationality and, and entanglements. To visually support the narrative of the essay that we called Accidental Geopoetics, we created geoponchos. These are costumes for role play, through which human body connects to the planetary body. And how to activate it? Yeah, by action. So some methods um, we've learned from Marta Araujo, Brazilian performer and activist who pioneered the power of poncho. Uh, already 40 years ago, she experimented with different forms of embodiment, uh, entrapment and collective wear wearables. Important to mention here are also experiments in pedagogy and games, um, a process called de-schooling by Chilean architect and educator uh, Casanueva, Manuel Casanueva. And this led to a series of architectural slash performative exercises in seventeens in 70s. What you can see on the photo, at the time Casanueva questioned how people relate to each other 
and the space around them. So they make these experiments. And how can be various spaces constructed with understanding spatialities where living bodies interact? So it's all about action and interaction. And um, different tokens, spatial props and these ponchos, they are powerful tools. So we learn from, from Marta Arroyo, we learn from Casanueva. And the one who has, um, has them or uses them, or let's say the one who wears these ponchos and carries these tokens, can become something or somebody else through the means of role play or performance. Uh, but through means of role play, you can become the other, somebody else. In role play, you are navigating the perspectives of others and otherness. And that's accompanying our essay, Accidental Boy Geopolitics. And what you can see on the photo, it's performative design intervention that happened in Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam. And the whole museum became a stage, a place where real and imagination meet together. Remember, performance transforms viewer participant and you, the architect, designer, the creator. Performative design brings other values than monetary. It's about different things than money, like understanding, sharing, joy, excitement, or when we do it together with participants, it brings the, new, the special value of being together and it brings this Collective, collective memory and all sorts of feelings and emotions. Yeah, in accidental geopoetics, performers truly became stones and chemical elements from the upper crust of the planet and they felt deeply entangled with what they imagined Earth is feeling. But this special moment of connection happened after a few hours, so this whole performative event lasts for six hours, eh? so it's, it's not an immediate transformation, it's not immediate change, you need to give it time. The message would be, use your imagination to amplify what matters. Use your designs, proposals to make stories, to touch people in a way that it's not measured. And we aim for collective storytelling. Yes, it's a challenge right now to talk about all this playfulness and utopic futures and fantasy and transformation through playfulness and playgrounds when so many people are struggling at the moment, struggling to survive. Or also in the pandemic or in different waves of, of pandemic as precarious workers and of course living in oppressive regimes or different power grips and so on and so on. So we should use that privilege that we can talk about it and think about the positive change that we would like to make and work on it. Use our talents, use our time, use our resources to either ship them somewhere where it's more needed, in communities where it's needed, or to design things, situations, experiences, um, to aim for it, to work on it, to do it. Because this situation allows us to critically reflect on our current experience, all of us. So I would like us to consider how such lessons might influence our lives and design or architectural activities moving forward. And we can discuss it in the chat of the last live experience that we are going to dive into together. Uh, we will meet in the dev.progressbar.club so dev.progressbar.club and we can discuss it there all together. So that's everything from me right now regarding the talk, the presentation, the lecture and we are going to meet online here, okay? So go there, find me there and um, yeah, thank you so much. See you. Bye.